Meach Lake for Sunday dinner. The First Ministers will meet privately to try to settle the stalemate. Punishment for an insult. This Quebec MP is demoted for his comments about Clyde Wells and Newton Blanders. And strike in Grand Falls. 800 loggers say Abbott to be Price made an insulting contract offer. Here and now. Good evening, I'm Carl Wells. I'll have the weather as well tonight, and Jonathan Crow will have sports. Carl, the end of the line for Helen Kelsey at the French Open uh, today, and the end of the line for Michel Bergeron as the coach of the Quebec Nordique. Thanks, Jonathan. The weeks of speculation are over. Prime Minister Mulroney is calling the premiers together to try to break the deadlock over Meech Lake. The first ministers are going to Ottawa for a private working dinner on Sunday night. Mulroney says if everything goes well, a full-scale First Ministers' conference will begin on Monday morning. More from Denise Harrington in Ottawa. Prime Minister Brian Mulroney says he and the Premiers have made enough progress and talked about Meech Lake to justify all of them sitting down together. If, Mr. Speaker, there is the political will to break the impasse, surely there is a constitutional way. So I am inviting First Ministers to a working dinner on Sunday evening to find out if sufficient political will truly exists. If the dinner goes well, Mulroney says, it will be extended into a formal First Minister's meeting on Monday morning. The Prime Minister says there's a symbolism to the meeting. It's the third anniversary of the day he and ten provincial premiers negotiated and signed the final deal to make Quebec a partner in the Constitution. If some provinces fail to ratify the accord now, Mulroney says the country is in peril. What is in dispute is modest, extremely modest, when compared with what is really at stake. What is really at stake is Canada. But the Liberals say Mulroney should have called the Premiers together sooner and should promise now that their meeting will last more than one night. Speaker, I know that the Prime Minister has been concerned about the risk if there is such a meeting and it is not a success. But Mr. Speaker, there are also risks perhaps even greater risk if such a meeting is not held at all. The NDP also said the meeting is overdue. This could be the most important meeting that the first ministers of this country have ever held in the 123 year history of Canada. And we must set aside the, the partisan concerns to make sure that there is an agreement. But Mulroney cautions crucial differences remain among the first ministers. The biggest obstacle when they meet is expected to be the accord's requirement for unanimous provincial approval of Senate reform. The premiers of Newfoundland and Manitoba say that formula makes Senate reform impossible, and they're expected to insist it be dropped before they ratify the accord. Denise Harrington, CBC News, Ottawa. Claude Wells has been asking for just such a meeting for months, but he's not optimistic about one now. I'm concerned now that the, the thing is being set up in a way where there's a dinner first, and then there may not be uh, a meeting where the premiers would be in that position. So I, I, I guess I'm happy that a process of some sort is started, but I still emphasize that I think all of us have had the responsibility to justify our position to, to the whole of the people of Canada and not just the constituency that we happen to politically represent. The Assistant Deputy Speaker in the House of Commons resigns the position today. Denis Pronovo, a Conservative from Quebec, quit just hours after making disparaging remarks about Clyde Wells and Newfoundlanders. The remarks were made yesterday while Pronovo was discussing Meech Lake on a radio talk show in Trois-Rivières, Quebec. Today, Wells used the incident to try to strengthen his opposition to the Meech Lake deal. Juanita Barry reports. It was on a radio talk show in Trois-Rivières that Denis Pronovo launched his assault on Clyde Wells and Newfoundland. He described Wells as a mental case, a dangerous man, and called Newfoundland a third world country. But he didn't stop there. He said Newfoundlanders have a mentality different from the rest of Canada, and that 44% have trouble reading and writing. Prior to his resignation, Pronovo phoned Wells and apologized for the remark. The Premier accepted the apology, but couldn't resist the urge to use the entire incident to further his attack on Meech Lake. But I also said to him, that, in fact, some of the things, some of the comments you made 
make a far more eloquent plea for putting in place an amending procedure that will ensure a Triple E Senate to protect the economic future of the smaller provinces, to ensure that our people will no longer be living on unemployment insurance, and we can develop an educational system that will not leave our, our, our people with the highest level of illiteracy in Canada. Cronovo's remarks had also been front and center in the House of Assembly this afternoon, and even the opposition found itself in the Premier's corner. The Tories wrote the Prime Minister and officially objected to Pronovo's comments, but Wells found the gesture hypocritical. And to hear the opposition get up today and, and, and feign this great indignation at the comments of Monsieur Pronovo, when they're leading the way in, in, in the House of Assembly here, uh, is, is, is in fact a double insult. I think that's ridiculous. I mean, we've been talking about the effect of the Premier's position and strategy on Meech Lake. We haven't been maligning the Premier personally, and we certainly haven't been insulting the character of the people of the province. Pronovo announced his resignation through House of Commons Speaker John Fraser. He said his apology wasn't enough, that it was necessary to resign from what he called the important position of Assistant Deputy Speaker. For CBC News, I'm Juanita Berry. Also, here at home, pro Meech Lake supporters brought more pressure on Clyde Wells today. Several provincial business leaders called a news conference to warn that Canada is in real danger of breaking up. Fred Sharon reports. They call themselves Newfoundlanders and Labradorians for Confederation. They banded together two days ago because they're worried about what they see happening in the country. This was a spontaneous group of people who were driving around in cars, worried sick, not getting to sleep at night, uh, 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 NDP, <laughs> Liberal, Tories. This is no Tory plot. Believe me, nobody... This, this is a cry from the heart. Are we going to stay together? Are we going to have a Canada? Are we going to end up a fragmented society? Millionaire businessman Craig Dobbin says there's no doubt the Meech Lake Accord is flawed, but the economic and political consequences of not signing it will be far worse for Newfoundland and Canada. Former New Democratic MHA Gene Long says the same thing. There's a lot more at stake in this debate than simply responding in a knee-jerk fashion to the demands of Quebec. Dobbin and others met last night with Premier Wells and gave him the same message. His response? Because they are the victims of this fueled sense of national crisis. And frankly, I, I think that that is, is an abhorrent way to, to consider constitutional changes that, are, that will affect this country so profoundly for the next century. It's shocking to be doing that. It, it's, a, it's a gross insult to the democratic process. Wells says he's not convinced the country is breaking up. And when asked if he thought this afternoon's news conference by Dobbin and friends was part of a strategy to discredit him, he said he has no reason to know it's so, but... If it isn't orchestrated, it's, it's great coincidence. Red Sharon, CBC News, St. John. At the same time, a new poll shows that Newfoundlanders will support Premier Wells on Meech Lake even if the Premier changes his mind. The poll was conducted by baseline research of Fredericton, New Brunswick. It says, if a referendum were held now, 52% of Newfoundlanders would support Wells and vote to reject the Meech Lake deal. Only 27% would vote for the deal. But those figures change dramatically in the case of the Premier making progress in his talks with the other First Ministers. If that happens, and then asked voters to support Meech, 63% would say yes. Only 16% would still vote no. 350 people were interviewed. The survey is considered accurate to within 3.5%, 19 times out of 20. Some good news today for anyone in debt. The Bank of Canada today cut its lending rate slightly. It now stands at just below 14%. Analysts say it's because of the renewed hope that Meech Lake can be saved. Also, the Canadian dollar has been stronger this week. In other news, striking unionized loggers in central Newfoundland say the last contract offer from Abitibi Price was an insult. About 800 loggers voted on the package yesterday. More than 90% of them rejected it because it does little to narrow the wage gap with mainland loggers. Right after the vote, the loggers set up picket lines around the Grand Falls newsprint mill. Larry Hudson reports. 
hundreds of bloggers packed the Grand Falls Arts and Culture Centre to receive details of the latest company offer. The negotiating team recommended rejection, but it was left to members of CPU Local 60 to decide for themselves. And that didn't take long, as the loggers headed to collect ballot slips to solidly reject the offer and go on strike. When the meeting ended, several hundred loggers carrying placards and chanting slogans marched to the mill. Practically everyone wanted a new deal on wages and benefits. Because there's nothing to across. We want better wages and better pension plans. We're not getting no wages in the woods and, 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 and uh, the pensions. When we, give, we don't get nothing when we get out of work. Within half an hour, a picket line was thrown up at the entrance to the company's wood yard and the first trucks were turned around. We're stopping them trucks from going in the wood yard. They're going in after or bark or something. We don't care what it is, but they're not going in. That's, that's the name of the game. The loggers have vowed that not one stick of pulp would cut by independence will be permitted to cross into the Abitibi Price woodlot. And they say it's only a matter of time before the company runs out of raw material and is forced to come to terms with the union. This is Larry Hudson reporting from Grand Falls. When asked about the strike today, a spokesman for Abitibi Price says the company has a policy never to comment on labor disputes. There was a legal row at the Hughes Commission this afternoon concerning evidence given by two RCMP officers last week. The officers had disagreed over how an investigation had been handled in the summer of 1988. The investigation centered around a complaint that a parent had sexually assaulted his foster daughter. Before the RCMP charged the man, another teenage foster girl in his home committed suicide. Now there's a new piece of information, and one of those officers wants the commission to take another look at the matter. Jay Callanan reports. These are the two RCMP officers at the center of the dispute. Sergeant Douglas Hamlin was head of the Holywood Detachment at the time of the investigation. He's already told the commission that the detachment did all it could with the case. But Superintendent Emerson Kaiser of RCMP headquarters disagreed with the timeliness and appropriateness of the detachment's investigation. He told that to the commission, and he also told that to the Holywood detachment in mid-August 1988. He said he would have given the investigation far greater priority. This afternoon, a new piece of information was revealed. It had earlier been overlooked in the RCMP files. Sergeant Hamlin's lawyer said the document might change the view of whether the investigation was properly carried out. The reality of the situation is based on the, on the piece of evidence that we've just entered, Exhibit RR1, uh, we have a contented headquarters on the 2nd of September when they came back and said no further reporting is required at this time. But will that document make a difference in how the Commission views the incident? The RCMP lawyer didn't think so. Uh, I view um, this uh, application as, as uh, essentially a reduction of the Commission process to uh, a personal matter, a, a, a personal disagreement. Commissioner Samuel Hughes appeared to agree. I'm supposed to be dealing with the response, whatever it was and whatever the internal opinion of members of the RCM police may be, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's of no interest, but it's of no consequence to this inquiry. Hughes says he won't make a decision to call both officers back to testify until after he looks at his notes and reviews the evidence both officers have already given to the commission. Jay Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Tomorrow marks a big change for Newfoundland drivers. That's when the province will begin its new demerit point system. So drivers beware, traffic violations will now cost you more than just money. Pamela Tennant reports. In this simulated exercise put on by police today, a driver is pulled over in St. John's for speeding. But starting tomorrow, drivers will not only be fined for moving traffic violations, they'll get demerit points as well. How many points you get depends on the violation. For example, failure to stop at a stop sign, two points. Not using turn signals, two points. Failure to wear seat belts, two points. And for driving an uninsured vehicle, six points. 
If a driver accumulates 12 points within two years, the license will be suspended for two months. For speeding, the number of points you get depends on how fast you're going over the speed limit. Police feel the new system will help slow down speeders and improve driver safety. Chronic violators will simply pay the tickets at the end of the year in order to get a license. Now a violator is going to find themselves in a position that once they accumulate a number of points uh, to a maximum of 12, they're going to be uh, they're going to be issued a suspension. Public opinion on the new point system varies. I think it'll be good for driving in Newfoundland. Why? I think it will make drivers more conscious of safety. So you don't think it'll make much difference? I don't. I don't really think so. I mean, in terms of traffic and speeding tickets and stuff, at this point in time, it's uh, uh, a certain number of tickets over a you know specified period. You're you have uh, uh, possibilities of losing your license or substantial increases in fines and stuff. So uh, there are already some deterrents. Like it or not, the new system goes into effect at midnight tonight. Any points that you get remain on your record for two years. Pamela Tennant, CBC News, St. John. And coming up next on Here and Now, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and U.S. President George Bush have started their Washington summit. are proud to announce the grand opening of their newest store in Caligros. And in honor of their 26th location opening Thursday, Cohen's are having a grand opening sale right across Newfoundland. This Wednesday through Saturday, get box spring and mattress sets starting as low as $299. Microwave ovens, $133 and up, and unbelievable prices and all your carpeting and flooring needs. Plus, there's no money down, no interest, no payments till November. Cohen's Home Furnishings grand opening sale happening now. This is one you can't afford to miss. When it's time for a bite to eat, our whole family loves the fresh, crisp taste of Purity Cream Crackers and Milk Lunch Biscuits. They're so good, everyone loves them, with some jam or a bit of butter. Purity Crackers are always fresh, always crisp, because they're made right here, just the way we like them. Purity. Four tires for the price of three. Yep. Deals like that don't come along every day. Nope. Let me see here. Four, carry the three. Uh, wow, that's a good deal. The Goodyear Grand Slam Tire Sale. Four for the price of three on selected tires and many other great values. Gotta get to Goodyear, go down here, turn right. Now then. Your GM dealers all across the province present an incredible offer on GMC and Chevy full-size pickups. Now, choose 10.5% plans or $1,000 for a limited time, qualified buyers can take advantage of this special offer. 10.9% for the cash It's GMC and Chevy full-size pickups now at your Newfoundland and Labrador GM dealers. In Washington, U.S. President George Bush and Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev have started their second summit meeting in six months. And they're talking about an irreversible period of peace between the world's superpowers. But the two leaders still have their differences, especially the question of where a united Germany will fit into world affairs. Tom Kennedy reports. It has already been billed the summit of low expectations. Mikhail Gorbachev and George Bush will talk over many issues. They'll sign several agreements as well that have already been worked out. But on significant issues, such as a unified Germany and NATO, arms control, the Baltic Republic, on these, it does not sound as though George Bush expects breakthroughs, just slow and steady progress. We're not going to solve all of the world's problems. 
We won't resolve all of the outstanding issues that divide us, but we can and will take significant steps toward a new relationship. And Gorbachev spoke of getting to know the United States and how he and George Bush are beginning a new era of history. The walls which for years separated the people are collapsing. The trenches of the Cold War are disappearing. The fog of prejudice, mistrust, and animosity is vanishing. Their first meeting was supposed to last 90 minutes, but it was more than two hours before they emerged. Later, the press secretaries for each leader met the international media. They were in good spirits, and conversation ranged across all the issues facing this summit as a prelude to specific discussions to be held tonight, tomorrow, and Saturday at Camp David. Gorbachev went on to the Soviet embassy where he spoke to an invited audience of American intellectuals. It was a performance, really, an intelligent and seductive description of what he is trying to do politically and an explanation of why he must go slowly with some of his economic reforms. We have to start from the scratch because some people believe that a market is a speculation. And for you, speculation is a mark. And uh, you see what a change in uh, our perceptions is needed. After lunch, Gorbachev headed back to the White House, and in keeping with his gregarious image, he waded into an unscheduled meeting with the media. What is very important is that Soviet-American relations increasingly dynamic and substantive and go through on a regular basis. That's very important. That does not mean that each meeting must become a real watershed and so on, but we have to move on the relationship to the relationship for the benefit of the entire landscape of So don't expect every superpower meeting to be a watershed. It's more important, he said, that we get along. And with that, Gorbachev began a series of detailed meetings, during which he and Bush will talk over some of the most difficult issues between the two countries. Tom Kennedy, CBC News, Washington. An Indian leader from Alberta is criticizing Prime Minister Mulroney for refusing to attend a national chiefs meeting. Jerome Morin, chief of a Cree band near Edmonton, says Indian Affairs Minister Tom Sidden has also not answered an invitation to attend the July meeting. Earlier today, the Supreme Court said judges must give generous and liberal interpretations of native rights. The ruling covers fishing, hunting, and land claims when dealing with federal and uh, provincial laws. In New York, the fraud trial of Imelda Marcos is on hold for the third time in a month because she's fallen ill. The former Philippine First Lady, who has high blood pressure, collapsed during today's court session and was taken to a hospital. Marcos is accused of helping her late husband steal $200 million from the Philippine Treasury. After the break, Deborah Collins will be by for intermission, and tonight, a look at a critic being snubbed by a production company. This is the new Passat from Volkswagen, and it's everything a true European wagon is meant to be. The way it looks, feels, and drives is distinctively European. But the biggest news is inside, with room for five, fully adjustable seats front and back, and an enormous 68.9 cubic feet of cargo space. Passat Wagon. It's never been easier to put your family in a Volkswagen. The new Passat. It's time to think about Volkswagen again. What are you having, guys? The usual. The usual. Brand flakes. Don't you usually get the usual? Usually. Now I eat Kellogg's Bran Flakes. They taste good. So you're not having the usual? Nope. How come? Look, I'm trying to eat food that's good for me. You're trying to eat food that's good for you? Yeah. Bran Flakes is a good source of dietary fiber, which is good for you. Whole wheat, which is good for you. And nutrients, which are good for you. So you think Bran Flakes are good for you? Well, there's even an echo in here. Kellogg's Bran Flakes. <laughs> good for you. If you're looking for a larger or more reliable vehicle for your holidays, give Rent-A-Wreck a call. Rent -a -wreck. Drive a good bargain. Beef.
Today, a serving of sirloin steak has as little cholesterol as an equal serving of roast chicken without the skin. So it's your beef. Beef. Hot noodles. Hot dip. A Yuki microwave Philadelphia dips. Hot tomato, hot potato. Hot sauce. You can microwave Philadelphia dips. Heat them up in a flash and give your dish more dip. Hmm. Hot sauce. Every day, you know there's nothing. Like it. That taste, central dairy milk, milk that makes your day. So live the wholesome way, the central dairy's way for refreshment and great taste. Central dairy milk, milk that makes your day. When it's time to buy wine. For all your building supplies Hickman serves you better You know we'll treat you right From plumbing and electrical To lumber and building supplies We've got the know-how We've got the people On Hickman's you can rely Hickman's building center Wi-Fi in building supplies and now it's time for intermission, our weekly review of the arts with Deborah Collins. And Deborah, I understand that arts groups are stepping up the pressure on the provincial government to release a major review of the arts. That's right, Carl. It's now been two months since an arts review committee submitted its recommendations to government. And arts groups say it's time for government to do something. To that end, the Writers' Alliance, in conjunction with several other arts groups, has written Premier Wells asking him to get involved. They're afraid the report has been lost in the shuffle on the desk of Municipal Affairs Minister Eric Gulledge. Obviously, the arts have been put into a portfolio, Department of Municipal and Provincial Affairs, which is really uh, too large and spreading, and I think the arts just uh, too, all too often get pushed off to one side. So is the Premier the key, do you feel? Well, he may well be. Um, I, I think that the government uh, hasn't, as I said, shown uh, a serious intent in this whole area of the arts, funding of the arts, and interest in the arts. I think the arts are largely ignored. Uh, and I'm talking about art and artists. Uh, I'm not talking about building new buildings and so on. I'm actually talking about the working artists in this province. And uh, that should change. Meanwhile, a spokesperson for the Premier's office says Wells has received the letter, but wants to discuss the matter with the minister before making a statement. Breakwater Books Limited of St. John's is $100,000 richer this week thanks to a grant from the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. Breakwater plans to use the money to capture a bigger share of the North American market. The company will place particular emphasis on British Columbia, where the Minister of Education has already recommended six of Breakwater's publications for its school curriculum. Pathways, channels and barriers, that was the theme of Art Month now drawing to a close. One of the more interesting interpretations of that theme was made by art and design students at the Glovertown Regional High School. What began as individual projects turned into a 12-foot group effort, charting the different stages and pathways of life, and some of the barriers encountered along the way. Now that the month is over, the students are reluctant to dismantle their project and are looking for a more permanent place to display it. Bored with art? That's what you'll get at an art exhibition opening tonight at the Munn Gallery in St. John's. B-O-A-R-D, that is, in Board Games. A traveling exhibition from the Montreal Museum of Fine Art, The Connoisseur Within, allows visitors a chance to create their own art exhibit on game boards placed throughout the room. The point is to show visitors that the value of art doesn't lie only in the objects themselves, but in the hearts and minds of observers. This hands-on exhibit runs until June 24th. At the LSU Hall in St. John's tonight, the latest offering from the Elysian Players. Miss Julie by August Strindberg began a two-week run last night. Set on Midsummer's Eve more than a hundred years ago, it explores what the director calls the jungle battle between the sexes, often quite graphically. 
Edmund McLean says the play should be viewed with an open mind. Well, I hope the audience that comes to this know they're seeing a classical piece of theater and some of all the saying come with your imaginations and your mind open wide. No, I don't do anything for shock value. It's not like a peep show or you won't be here as a voyeur. You'll be here, everything that's done in the play is for a reason. I mean, this man was not about fear or hatred. He was about hurting. And I'm trying to show what that's like and what it can be like and to be very honest about it. But Miss Julie didn't represent the only battle of wills at the LSPU Hall last night. In a highly unusual move, the artistic director of the Elysians has told a local theater critic not to review any more of their work. But as we see in the following report, that is easier said than done. The drama at the LSPU Hall got underway last night before the latest Elysian play even began. Theater critic Peter Gard came to the show. He wasn't supposed to, according to the Elysian's artistic director, Ed Martin. At least not in an official capacity. A month ago, Martin asked Gard not to review any more Elysian productions. That as a critic, he wasn't qualified and wouldn't be welcomed. Gard didn't listen. Ed just doesn't have that right. I mean, Ed has a lot of problems to figure out what he has the right to do and not to do. And I just doesn't have that right to tell somebody that they can't. He didn't have that right to tell me that I can't review his work. It all began with a recent magazine story about Codco, a Newfoundland comedy troupe, a story which turned into a bit of critic bashing. According to Codco, most local critics are self-styled experts, irresponsible, dilettante, have little or no theatrical experience, and refuse to understand where Newfoundland writers and actors are coming from. Two weeks later, Gard retaliated, calling the remarks abusive and claiming there are low and unfair things critics could say about artists, but don't that so-and-so is ignorant, that someone else is a drunkard, dishonest, lacking talent or taste. A few days later, Gard became persona non grata with the Elysians, and the issue became a headline. Martin declined to do an interview on camera. He says his request to Gard was a personal and a private one, that it was Gard who chose to make it a public issue. Martin says he doesn't want to give the matter any more publicity, nor Gard any more credibility, by restating his views on camera. They did go head-to-head, -head, however, in a recent Newfoundland magazine. In addition to Gard's comments about what he could say about artists if he chose, Martin also took exception to Gard's acknowledgement that he sometimes reads other reviews before writing his own. I've never considered that to be a big issue. Thinking back on it, I now realize that I don't actually listen to too many other reviewers. I occasionally catch uh, what Gordon says in the morning. I certainly don't listen to reviewers uh, uh, if I haven't myself seen the work. Finally, Martin objects to Gard's claim that he doesn't need personal experience in the theater or its language to review it. I personally don't draw a big line between a, what a critic does and what a member of the audience uh, sees. Uh, that's a personal decision on my part. I think Ed uh, mistook that as an absence of qualification, I think. You know, if I personalize my column, it's, he feels that that's a sign that I'm not talking in the abstract language of criticism. Gard attributes the whole thing to a poor review he gave an Elysian production several months ago. Martin says it has nothing to do with reviews, it's a matter of principle. Other critics in last night's audience were reluctant to get involved in the debate. The consensus being that it was not that serious, would soon blow over, and attention should focus on the stage, not the critics. As for Gard, he says he'll continue to review the Elysians despite being panned by them, he says no one but his editors and publishers have the right to tell him otherwise. The only difference these days is that now he has to buy his tickets. And that is it for this week. Tune in next week when we'll have the winners of this year's Art and Letters competition. Good night. <laughs>
tickets from as low as $9,295. Incredible deals on award-winning Accord Coupes sedans as low as $16,695. This is it, the incredible 1990 Honda Clear Up. See your Atlantic Honda dealer. Our bottom line, it's never been better. Excuse me, which scratch and win ticket looks lucky? This new game is taking off. Put on your high heel sneakers. Wear your wig hat on your head. Put on your red dress, lady. Cause we're going out tonight. You need any more help? I can handle it. Don't you know you're gonna knock them dead? If you're looking for a little excitement, we've got lots of great new games. So play Scratch and Win Lottery. It's fun to be lucky. Hi, I'm Fred McGilvery, President and General Manager of Bowling's Limited. We're here to ask for your generous support for this year's Children's Miracle Network Telethon. At Bowling's and IGA, we're very proud to be part of this worthy cause. We have employees like Kathy and Myrna who have held bake sales, walkathons, and many projects to raise money to help children like Dorothy and Jason lead healthier lives. Please join us on June 2nd and 3rd on CBC. Help Imagine visiting yourself in the future. Hi. Hi. You're me. Mm -hmm. We're us. 25 years later. How are we? Fine. We living down here? Winters, yeah. How can we afford it? Freedom 55. Freedom 55. Freedom 55. Protection today, plus a financial program that works, so one day you won't have to. Freedom 55. Talk to a London Life representative. That'll be for you. Lloyd Shepard took the stand today in his own defense as his trial continued in the Supreme Court in Cornerbrook. Shepard is charged with procuring and trying to procure a woman to have sex with other men and with breach of trust. Shepard was a social worker. The woman who brought the charges against him is on welfare. In court today, Shepard denied all the charges against him. Doug Greer reports. Shepard said he never discussed sex for money with the woman who laid the charges against him. He said he never discussed sex with her. And he told his lawyer, Kim Howe, he has no idea why the woman would have laid the charges. One of the charges says Shepard set up his cousin, Cyril, to have sex with the woman. Yesterday on the stand, Cyril Shepard said he had had sex with the woman, but he set himself up. It had nothing to do with Lloyd. Cyril Shepard said he broke off his relationship with the woman the day after Lloyd found out about it. Today, Lloyd Shepard told the same story. He said he went to visit Cyril in his hotel room and found him with the woman. Howe asked him if he had had a conversation with Cyril about the affair. If you call an outburst of anger a conversation, yes, we had a conversation, said Shepard. Shepard told Howe he was furious with his cousin for having a woman in his hotel room. Howe asked him, did you tell him off? You better believe it, Shepard replied. Another charge says Shepard tried to set the woman up with the former Minister of Social Services, Tom Hickey. Today, Shepard testified that he doesn't know Hickey personally, that he never socialized with him, and that he never tried to set the woman up to have sex with Hickey or with anyone else. Crown Prosecutor Mike Madden also had questions for Shepard. Madden asked Shepard about his dealings with the woman in his job at Social Services. Shepard told Madden that as far as he's concerned, he treated the woman like any other client. Shepard will be back on the stand tomorrow. Doug Greer, CBC News, Cornerbrook. A liberal MHA came out swinging at the government today. Bill Hogan, the MHA for Placentia, was critical of the government's decision to not support year-round ferry service to Argentia. Hogan told a news conference today the decision was ill-advised. He says his research shows there would be little or no impact on other shipping communities in the province if Argentia got year-round service. When asked if he felt uncomfortable taking a stand against his own government policy, Hogan said that not at all. I, I don't think just many Newfoundlanders don't know my position on the Argentia ferry. Like I say, I've been at it 15 years, and I'd be more surprised or disappointed if my government uh, thought that I should not express my opinion on this subject. I've been with it a very long while. As for the mayors of the Argentia region, they say the decision announced yesterday about ferry services is a kick in the teeth. And the mayors came to St. John's today to make their anger known. We are frustrated, disappointed, and damn angry 
that this government could place political expediency and the interests of their business friends above the greater good of this province. About a hundred support staff on their day off set up information picket lines at St. Patrick's Mercy Home in St. John's this afternoon. The workers say morale is at an all-time low. They say that's because management is doing union work. The union wants a meeting with the board of directors. According to the union, there has been a 75% staff turnover in two years. Provincial wildlife officials say RCMP and Western Labrador were told by higher authorities not to get involved in last week's illegal goose hunt by Inu hunters. The decision not to make any arrests has everybody upset. The Inu, who are trying to make a point, non-native hunters who say hunting regulations should apply to all, and the provincial government, which hasn't been told what's going on. Atso Rizori reports. <coughs> It was a blatant challenge to the white man's law. Quebec Inu from Settile and Shefferville blasting away at flocks of Canada geese on the western Labrador border last week. Illegally, because the hunting season has been closed for months. Alonzo Drover of the Labrador West Caribou Hunters Association is still outraged that nobody was charged. I'm upset because uh this face is young. I believe in Rico Wright and uh, the thing is uh, there was a big injustice done, was 150 geese killed on Labrador and the uh, thing was they were let go. No, nothing was done. It's not as if the 150 in involved tried to slip away. Here they are, last Friday, flaunting their harvest in broad daylight, waiting to be charged so they could fight Canada's hunting laws in court. Drover agrees that's exactly where they should be, in court. See those people? charged and if it ever happened again the proper thing done and those people arrested. Provincial officials believe RCMP were told by federal authorities not to get involved with the goose train. Environment Minister Jim Callan says he's determined to find out at what level that decision was made. Uh, if there's a change in policy for these situations by Ottawa, uh, what they intend to do in, in any future occurrences which could, ha could, ha could happen tomorrow. All this is happening at a time when the tide seems to be turning. Today the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that judges must apply generous and liberal interpretations when dealing with native rights issues. The issue that led to that decision was fishing rights in British Columbia. Tomorrow it could be hunting rights in Labrador. For CBC News, I'm up for a glory. And still to come on here and now, Jonathan Crow will have sports and uh, I'll have the weather. And it looks like things are going to brighten up tomorrow and hopefully those strong winds will finally die down. I'll have details after this. Dear Spears Optical, my daughter told me about your service. She said your prices are really good. Eyewear can be a big expense for someone my age, so I took her advice. And my new bifocals cost me only $99. I was also impressed by your selection of frames and the courteous service I was given. I don't know who that daughter of mine turns after, but she is one smart cookie. Anyway, keep up the good work, Spears Optical. Respectfully yours, Mom. Jeffrey Simpson, award-winning national columnist with the Globe and Mail. After 16 years in this business, I think I know something about good journalism. And that's why every week in Ottawa, I read the Sunday Express. It's lively, accessible, and it breaks more stories than papers ten times its size. I travel coast to coast, and I think the Sunday Express is the best weekly newspaper in Canada. The Sunday Express, it's what good journalism is all about. The Sunday Express, your Sunday best. Everyone is gearing up for the big checkered flag event at Canadian Tire. A week-long race for incredible savings on everything for the car. Choose Motomaster spark plugs for improved performance and fuel economy. This week, a Motomaster V-Groove 2-Pack is just $2.99. The checkered flag event at Canadian Tire. It only lasts a week. There's a lot more to Canadian Tire than tires. Can you imagine just how much it would take? 
to pick up the Toyota Camry Special Edition. Particularly when you add up the value of all these great extras. Well, the answer is a whole lot less than you think. You couldn't pick a better time to pick up a Toyota. Newfoundland fishermen have great respect for the sea. They also choose their outboards with care. That's why you'll find Mariner outboards the choice of many Newfoundland inshore fishermen. Mariner outboards are engineered with just one goal in mind, reliability. See the Mariner line of outboards at Fort Honda, Cornerbrook, Bruce's Recreation and Auto Center, Clarendon. Okay, well, what Wendy has been dicking today, uh, especially on the island, and especially on the apple, and you really need to be captured back in that way. Hopefully, uh, those things should be tied on some more. Anyway, this is what's going on in the corner center to the southwest. It will make the cloudy with the shepherds of Vancouver, 10 degrees there. Highs on the current stretching from 17 in Edmonton to 26 in the big and what's that? What's the hot spot across the country today? Well, sun back well. 22 and sunny for us in Toronto. 17 for me on the south. Me in Halifax and 8 degrees. 18 times to the end of the sun. It's right now this afternoon. We've got some sunny here. Now, for Lampedo today, it's still going on cloudy. Snow's out of Everdorf and different strategy from minus 1 below right up to about 4 degrees to the end of the day. Up the aisle of the it was considerably uh, cloudy. With the uh, snow to the northwest and resting this afternoon from the southeast, and the uh, temperatures ranging from a uh, four to eight, what is this? I don't know what that is. Northwest, heat and Anyway, uh, we have a low pressure system over us, uh, as you might expect. This is what uh, was responsible for all of the wind the island got today, and uh, that's going to carry the clouds. Uh, with it into the northeast tonight, up into uh, Labrador in the northern part of the island, and unfortunately it's going to carry some precipitation with it as well. Snow is in the forecast for the Bayvert northern peninsula and about the southern half of coastal Labrador, anywhere from 5 to 10 centimeters accumulation. Can you believe that in May? Uh, the wind will not, uh, not go, however, it looks like still a windy night for the island and Labrador. Gusts to 90 for the Avalon, gusts up to around 90 for the uh, southern half of coastal Labrador as well. Now for tonight and overnight for Labrador, cloudy still as mentioned along the coast monitor to the northwest west and for the island, uh, basically uh, for much of the island to the except the to the north of the very north potential getting that snow and strong westerly throughout the island. Horrible. For the Labrador it's going to be uh, generally cloudy, where some cleaning will take place tomorrow afternoon. And that low makes it stay off. Uh, the uh, metal area should start to get some sun breaks showing up uh, here on the squirrel afternoon. It's more moving into the line of sea area, however. The island is looks like get sun with clouds here for, for the most part. That cloud hanging around a little longer than the fact that the people need to talk about getting the sun to walk there. Strong in the southwesterly region. And your local forecast is the northern and Bayverde Peninsula, as well as uh, the Bateau to Lanto Claire portion of the Labrador coast. Tonight, uh, snow about 5 centimeters, minus 2. Uh, tomorrow, cloudy in the morning, then becoming sunny in the afternoon. Highs from 10 to 12, except 7 degrees in the onshore areas. For St. John's and the rest of the island, tonight, cloudy periods, 3 to 1 degree. Tomorrow, sunny with cloudy periods, highs from 8 in the onshore areas, up to 16 inland. For Labrador City, tonight cloudy, minus 2. Tomorrow cloudy with the chance of a shower, highs from 12 to 14. For Goose Bay, cloudy tonight, minus 2. Tomorrow uh, cloudy with some sunshine in the afternoon, some flurries in the morning, 7 degrees. And for uh, Postville to Cartwright, snow tonight, 15 centimeters, below zero, 
uh, tomorrow flurries in the morning, sunny in the afternoon, the high 8. And a quick look at the extended, as you can see, not too good for Labrador, but some uh, bright spots there for the island. And that weather picture tonight, by the way, is of Kitty Vitty Lake today and all the wind. That's the weather story. Now over to Jonathan Crow and sports. Thanks, Carl. Hi, everybody. Well, the defending women's champion won't be around to defend her title at the French Open. Arancha Sanchez Vicario played her doubles partner, Mercedes Paz, today, and she lost. 7-5, 3-6, 6-1 was the final in that one. Meanwhile, Helen Kelsey came into the day as Canada's last hope in singles play. She ended the day as a loser, though, also at the hands of her doubles partner. Hurricane Helen is in the near court, and she meets her doubles partner Monica Seles in round two in what ranks as certainly the loudest match of the day. Well played shot by Helen Kelsey. Kelsey wins the first set, but goes on to lose the next two, a 4-6, 6-4, 6-4 final, as Canada's last hope at the French Open heads for the sideline. Cammy McGregor takes on fellow American Jennifer Capriati. Capriati in the near court is 15 years old, but already she's making shots a veteran would be proud of. Capriati wins the first set 6-1. This is match point as teenage sensation Jennifer Capriati disposes of Cammy McGregor. 6-1, 6 love. French Open belt. As Cammy McGregor scalped it down Jennifer Capriati's and in impressive fashion once again. I almost feel like we're being redundant when we say that. 6-1, six, 6 love. Well, Kelsey may be out, but all is not lost as far as Canadians go at the French Open. Glenn Mishabata and Grant Connell are still alive in doubles play. They beat the Australian pair of Patrick Galbraith and David McPherson 4-6, 7-6, 6-3. Well, a year ago, Michel Bergeron was hailed as the man who was lead to lead the Quebec Nordique out of the NHL's wilderness. Today, he's unemployed. The Nordique fired Bergeron this morning, and it's expected they'll replace him with former Minnesota North Stars assistant Dave Chambers. The club has offered Bergeron a broadcasting job, but he hasn't said whether or not he'll take that. Well, the Expos stayed within striking distance of the National League East lead last night. Tim Wallach led the way against Atlanta and kept his club within four games of the first-place Pirates. Here's Bruce Goldbigan. Braves up 2 to nothing in the third inning, and then Ronnie Gant, the little outfielder, gets into this pitch from Bill Sappen, and it's 3 to nothing for Atlanta. Get that one a long way for a little guy. In the fourth, the Expos start to come back. Jim Wallach gets into a high-hanging pitch here. He takes it over the wall in Fulton County Stadium, and it's 3-1 to one for the Braves. We head to the fifth. Montreal Expos at bat once again. Dave Martinez subbing for the injured Marquise Grissom. He turns on this pitch from Tommy Glavin. It's a home run, his first on the season, and it's 3-2. The Expos tie it on a sacrifice fly, and then Tim Wallace will double to score Spike Owen and Andre Scalaraga. After the fifth, the Expos lead it 6-3. It's 7-3 Expos in the seventh, and back comes Wallace for some more. A double off the center field wall. He has four RBIs on the day. The Expos go on to beat the Braves 9-6. CBC Radio's morning show. That's my kind of radio.